Well, good morning. I think this is, yeah, there we go. Hi. Is this, am I on? Yeah, there we go. Hi, I'm Pastor Bob, and we're in person here. Uh, we're going to start worship on this beautiful, sunshiny day in just a few minutes. Uh, we're continuing on in our Building block series, and so I have something I'd like you to talk about. Uh, it's a question of when you're going through a transition or a change, who do you turn to for guidance? Who do you call? Who do you sit down with? Who do you talk with? Talk about that with someone near you, and we'll go online in just a couple minutes. Well, good morning to those of you in the room. Yeah, you can, you can respond. It's okay. There you go. Good morning. And good morning to those of you who are worshiping at home this morning. I'm Bob Fuchs. I'm the pastor here at Down River Church. And we are in person at 14400 Beach Daily. We're also streaming live on Facebook uh, Live. And we'll also be posting the worship service to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page, it'll get posted there. But if you're in the room and you've received your program, open it up. There is a lot going on over these next few weeks 
So I want to make sure that you're flipping through that and catching up on things. And if you're not in the room, you can uh, find it at our website. We also post during the week on our Facebook page. Elaine does an excellent job with that. Now, we are a church that seeks to grow with God, to serve our community, and to invite others into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And wherever you happen to be, take a moment, check in on Facebook, hashtag God is good. You can spread uh, the good news with others and share our posts. And if you're in the room uh, and you have not yet connected, we need to make sure we connect. If you're worshiping at home, you can do it online. This way we make sure we've got your current information and that we have a way to get, get in touch with you. We can also email you our prayer requests, uh, uh, concerns, as well as happenings around the church that uh, we send out an email every week so you know what's happening. But you can fill that out. And then on the back of that, because we are a praying community, we'll be talking, uh, we talk every week about prayer, but it, we'll be talking about it more today as uh, we're in worship. But if you have any prayer requests, joys or concerns, you can fill that out online or you can fill out the card and you can then uh, share those. We'll share those prayers with our prayer team and we know that prayers are powerful and they work and it's our way of connecting. Now we're also a very giving community and we do that in a lot of different ways. For our general giving, those, uh, that giving we give on a regular basis to make sure the lights stay on, that the air conditioning works during the summer, yes, and heat during the winter, all those different things. You can do that online or pick up one of these envelopes or you can even mail your gift in and then you take that along with your connect card and your prayer request and you put them in the basket in the back. Now we're going to be having a special offering over the next couple weeks. It starts this week. Uh, the Michigan Annual Conference holds its annual meeting the first weekend in June and so we have different annual conference giving opportunities. Just mark it on your envelope. There's a spot there for a blank for other, and it'll be supporting the Bishop Judith Craig's Children's Village in Liberia, uh, as well as our Haitian connection, and we'll also be uh, supporting after the storm, and I love that they've changed it. It used to be the Michigan Disaster Relief and Recovery, and they realized usually that happens after some sort of a storm, and so they've changed the name of that and so if you want to give to that annual conference special giving, you can do that as part of your giving. And uh, this morning, I'm really excited. It's blessing of the pets. And, and so during worship, we have a video we're going to run with slides, and then I'll be praying uh, for the pets afterwards. Enjoy. <laughs>
different names, and it would be, right? You sit down with someone and say, okay, why did you name your pet that? And the stories are just fantastic. Let's, let's join together in prayer. The animals of God's creation inhabit the skies, the earth, and the sea. They share in the fortunes of human existence and have a part in human life. God, who confers gifts on all living things, has often used the service of animals or made them reminders of the gifts of salvation. Animals were saved from the flood and afterwards made a part of the covenant with Noah. The Paschal Lamb recalls the Passover sacrifice and the deliverance from slavery in Egypt. A giant fish saved Jonah. Ravens brought bread to Elijah. Animals were included in the repentance of Nineveh. And animals share in Christ's redemption of all God's creation. We therefore invoke God's blessing on these animals as we do so. Let us praise the Creator and thank God for setting us as stewards over all the creatures of the earth. Amen. I give thanks to United Methodist Church for creating that prayer for these special days where we, uh, we pray over our pets. Uh, and as we continue in worship this morning, our music director, Tim Robbins, along with Colleen Mady, Bill Curtis, Gail Bricky, and myself, we're going to lead in music. But before we sing, uh, Linda Conger is going to bring us this morning's opening prayer. Linda. Good morning, Down River Church. This morning pra- morning's prayer is from Discipleship Ministries and posted on its website at umcdiscipleship.org. On difficult days when nothing goes well and life crushes and squeezes and hurts. On difficult days when you can find your voice and it feels like the right to choose is taken away. On difficult days when courage fails and the creature in all of us clamors to take the front seat, remind yourself that we are all waiting for the wind. Please stand as you are able, wherever you are worshiping, as we sing together, Friend of God.
This morning's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 14 in the Common English Bible. As a result, those who gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus replied, It isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away, and as they were staring towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking towards heaven? We'll come towards this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying, Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, Elpheus' son, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, James's son. All were united in their devotion up to prayer, along with some women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Thank you, Linda. I don't know about you and how your life has been, but whenever I'm faced with a decision or a transition or some change going in my life, uh, I don't always make the decision by myself. I will seek out others to help me. I remember when I was uh, trying to decide where to go to college. Talked to a few friends, looked at my major, talked to my counselor, right, at school. They helped out. And so when I decided where I was going to go, I, I went to the school so I could follow the girl that I liked. It's true. See, right? We have all this information. We get, do all this work, and we make our decisions in interesting ways, don't we? And then uh, there were times where uh, I'm going through potential job changes. Things were changing where I may have been working. Of course, Sue is one of the people, my wife, who I always talk to about major decisions and so I was deciding that, where do I go different jobs? A good friend of mine, John, John you know, told me, uh, you know, lead with your heart. And when you go to the interview, I may have shared this before, he said, be yourself, just not too much. And so I would take that advice and use that as I, as I would change jobs and decide where I was going next. And one of the bigger decisions and, uh, I had in my life was when I decided to go into the ministry, into vocational ministry to become a pastor. And I had a number of clergy colleagues, Sherry, Loretta, uh, Kenny, all who helped guide me as I made that decision. And prayer was always a big part of that decision and other decisions that I've made in my life. And so you can see what happens is, you know, as you go through life, as you go through these changes and these transitions and you experience different things, you pick up different people who guide you and advise you. And so that's what I've done throughout my life is I've found different people, experts sometimes uh, and sometimes not. But we try to seek out people to help us out to figure out where we're going when we make these changes, these transitions, and we have a decision to make. Well, welcome to worship on this Sunday morning, uh, May 21st. The sun is shining, it's beautiful out, and it looks like summer slash spring is finally going to stick this week. And we're using an outline, uh, Building Blocks, it was written by Martha K. Spong, she's a United Church of Christ pastor, and I say this every week because I love it, Executive Director of Rev Gal Blog Pals. And she wrote it for a preacher's guide to lectionary sermon series. Now, throughout this series, as we've talked about the building blocks of our faith, 
We've talked about what it means to become a believer. We've talked about ways that we can recognize Jesus in the world and in ourselves. We've talked about how we live together in community. We've talked about asking questions, even the difficult ones. And we talked about sharing our faith last week. Now, if you missed any of those weeks, you can always go to our YouTube channel, you can go to our website, and you can get caught up and learn a bit more about the building blocks of our faith. And this week, as we are in worship together, if you would like to follow along and take notes and then join us on Tuesday afternoon at 1.30, we'll be discussing this in greater detail. And you can take notes about the sermon and different uh, thoughts that can pop up and things that may hit your brain and your heart as we're sharing time this morning. Now, we're going to wrap up the series next week. Next week is Pentecost Sunday, and we're going to be responding to what it means when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we have that power. So remember, next week, wear red. Wear red. Got it? Don't wear scarlet and gray because people from Michigan might get upset. But wear red. And we'll share that day together. But this week, before we get to Pentecost, the building block this week is seeking guidance together. Now, there are times in our lives, I've shared a few in mine, where I've, we've faced big changes, big decisions. And so think back to a time in your life where you faced one of those moments, one of those defining moments, those changes in your life that were coming, that transition that was going to occur. You weren't sure where you should go, what path you should take, right? Those happen in all of our lives. So when you're transitioning to something new, who do you turn to? Who do you talk to? Shout it out. Husband. I heard, I'm sure I heard wife too. I'm just going to guess. Who else? Sisters. Bro friends. Brothers on occasion. I have a brother, so I know that. I'll call him sometimes. Teacher. Few... Oh, future employers. Okay. All right. So connecting with them. Got it. I understand. Thank you. The Holy Spirit, right? We turn to God in prayer. That's another place we can go and share as we try to figure out what we're going to do next. And there are times, I will admit, that the people I reach out to, and you may have done this as well, you reach out to somebody who's going to agree with your plan of action. Right? Right? Because you know what you want to do and you want them to, so you call the person you know will agree with you. Because in that way, you get to do what you want, right? But there are other times where it's those big decisions where you actually seek out those people when you truly want guidance. And you seek out those people who know you, who love you, who care about you, and will tell you the truth about how you should move forward and where you should go as you make that difficult transition, that decision. So it's not always the same people. It all depends on where you're going. Now for Jesus' followers, it's rather fascinating, they were faced with decisions throughout this Easter season. We've been talking about this. See, they had to decide what they were going to do next. Now I want to go back. I want to go back to the crucifixion. Because at that time, the crucifixion, Jesus' followers, they stayed together together. But they retreated, right? They hid in an upper room. See, and what happened, though, was they went there to grieve. They were afraid. But they didn't have much time to really do that because all they had was a Sabbath. And then a day after that, that was it. That was all they had. That night after, the next morning, things started to change. What we call Easter Sunday now. That morning, the surprises started, didn't they? All of a sudden, the women find the tomb empty and they run back and tell the others and then and then Jesus is alive that's what they told them and so some of the the disciples ran and took a look and they saw and they believed that the tomb was empty and then later that day Jesus appeared to Peter he, he appeared to the disciples walking to Emmaus and they came back and they were talking about that and the next thing you know Jesus shows up in the upper room and he shows them proof that he was alive and that he had been resurrected. 
and Luke then tells us in his gospel and here in the book of Acts, because if you didn't know this, Luke also wrote Acts. He tells us that he was with the disciples for 40 days. And during this time, he continued to teach them, he continued to be with them, and he continued to tell them more and more about the kingdom of God. And Jesus was giving them instructions about what he wanted them to do. Now, he was preparing them for a time that he would not be with them. See, death couldn't hold him, and he came back, but there was a time when he would not be with them. And what was happening and what would happen is called the ascension, when Jesus is taken up. And up on the screen is a couple pictures. Uh, the, the one on the, the left is the church of the ascension. And on the right is inside, in that square or rectangular shape is the rock where tradition holds that's where Jesus was taken up. Now, if you're not familiar and haven't been to the Holy Land, around the third century they went around and identified all these places, these events in Jesus' life, and on every one of them they built a church. So if you get, ever get a chance to go to the Holy Land or you've been there, you've experienced that. But this is where tradition holds that Jesus was taken up from the disciples and he ascended into heaven. But before this happened, the disciples wanted to know what would happen next. They've been asking Jesus that over and over. And Jesus often talked about the kingdom of God being restored. And so they asked him, When's this, you know, is now the time that you're going to do that? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And what Jesus, I love this, Jesus, as often as he answers a question, he doesn't answer the question. And this is one of those instances where he didn't answer their question. Instead, he said to them, rather you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's what Jesus told them. That they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. That's what Jesus answered when they asked, is the kingdom of God going to be restored now? I wonder if they stood there scratching your, their heads and going, okay, are you going to answer my question? I'm looking for guidance. I'm looking for advice. And you're not ready to give me that. Instead, you're telling me I'm going to be witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth? And then Jesus was gone. He was taken up into heaven. And, and, and you have to think about it. The disciples throughout their life with Jesus their time with Jesus, they had a chance to see so many wonders, so many amazing things. And after all they saw and experienced, here's what the disciples did when this happened. Wow. And they just stood there. I mean, I right? Have you ever done that? Now, and I love it when they talk about, you know, the two men telling them, you know, asking them why they're staying there. I still think their first words were like, you can close your mouths now. Yeah. You know, get it closed. Stop looking around. And because they were just frozen in time, they didn't know what to do next. They were stuck. And so they stood there and then those two men, it took someone speaking to them to break the ice to get them to move again. And then they were told that Jesus would come back in the same way that he left. And I know the disciples were thinking, okay, when? When? That's why we're staying here waiting. Is he coming back now or later? They didn't know what to do next. They didn't know what would become of them. They just know what Jesus told them, that they would be witnesses and the Holy Spirit would come upon them. See, they had given up everything to follow Jesus, and they continued to follow Jesus. And they were told to go and wait. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. They were waiting for that next wonder. They had just seen one, and they were waiting for the next one now. And when we experience a transition in our lives, or in the life of the church, we find ourselves in a similar situation, don't we? Things have changed. And you think about some of the changes that you've experienced in your life. I want you to take a moment and do that. You don't need to shout them out. But th think of some of those transitions, those changes that you've had to deal with. 
And as you think of those, some of them are exciting and unsettling at the same time, aren't they? They can be full of anticipation or a little bit of nervousness. Right? As we, as we think about it, they can be welcomed, right? We can say, yes, bring it on. Or we can resist it and go, uh, no, I like things the way they are. No need to change. I'm good. I like the shoes that I'm wearing. Don't bring out a new brand, a new model. They can be joyous, right? You can celebrate them. You run, you've run into somebody who's going through an amazing change and they just want to share it with you. And then other times, they can be full of anxiety and dread and someone may come up to you and you go, I don't know how I'm going to do this. What do I do now? And so all those times in our lives, all those things that can happen to us, all those experiences we have, all those changes that happen, they're not just personal. They can happen as a group. Downriver United Methodist Church is going through a transition, or will be very shortly. Last week it was announced that a new pastor has been assigned, Jonathan Combs. He'll be starting here July 1st. You already knew, I believe, I was retiring. And you should, if you haven't already received a letter, you will receive a letter in the mail sharing that news and that Jonathan will be coming here. And we're excited and a little bit nervous, right? What's going to happen next? How will things go? All of those feelings that I just talked about are going to be part of this transition. And so the question is, as it was for the disciples... What do we do in that in-between time? That in-between time, my last Sunday will be the 11th of June. That'll be my last Sunday to preach. We'll also be having a potluck afterwards because we're Methodists and we do potlucks. (laughs) But then those two Sundays after that, there'll be other people in to preach. And the question is, during that time of transition, between what we know now and what's to come, what will we, what will the church do together? And what I love about today's scripture and what we're talking about, how we're, we're handling this together, is that Jesus, his guidance to the disciples provides us that same guidance. And on your sermon note sheet, I reference uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 1. This is Jesus telling a parable about the need to pray continuously and to not get discouraged. That's what he told them. Jesus was telling them a parable about their need to pray continuously and not be discouraged. Pray. I heard some of you say that. Go, turn to God. Be in prayer together. So this is something Jesus didn't just tell them right before the ascension. This is something that he told them throughout their time together. And so his followers listened. Jesus had told them that the Holy Spirit would come. The two men who told them to go back to Jerusalem and wait, they said the same thing. And so they came together into that upper room and they prayed together. Now, when I, when I read the list of the names who were there, I'm thinking this is a pretty big air, oh, um, rental place. I mean, this is the entire, I can't believe this is just an upper room. Must have had a lot of bunk beds because you have Luke, telling us the 11 disciples were there, as well as Mary, the mother of Jesus, other women, and Jesus' brothers. They were all together. Now, I love that Luke specifically tells us that women were there because women were vital. They were the ones who first announced that the tomb was empty. And so I have to think that the other women they talk about, because they don't list them, but I have to believe it include Mary Magdalene, the sisters from Bethany, and those other women who were with them when they when they were at the foot of the cross and then when they went to the tomb that first Easter morning. And so the disciples, the women who were disciples, the women were included that. We always think of disciples as those 12, but disciples means followers, and all of them were following Jesus. So they all went to this upper room, that core group. They did not go back home. They didn't go back to their regular lives that they had before Jesus was present. So they stayed together, they stayed close, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed as they waited for what would come next. And I often wonder, if you find yourself in a situation where you're you're told, 
go wait for the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you wonder what that would look like? And I have to believe the disciples were in the same position. I wonder if in their conversations they started to develop scenarios. Okay, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And I believe they truly had no idea. They had no idea what was going to happen next. And I also think that they may have been a little bit nervous. Even though they knew they were going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus also told them that there were going to be witnesses, not just in Jerusalem, Samaria, but around the world. I mean, that's a pretty big responsibility, isn't it? I have to believe they were very nervous about this change, this transition in their lives. They truly did not know what was going to happen next. They didn't know, and yet they were told to trust, they were told to wait, so they stayed together, they prayed together. And when we think of those things, they are very instructive and very helpful for the life of the church today. And I'm not just talking Down River United Methodist Church. I'm talking the big church, the church around the globe. Waiting, waiting is hard. Waiting is difficult. We're impatient. We want it now. We want to know what's going to happen next. So Luke is telling us that these real men, these real women, they waited for the Spirit. They waited for the Holy Spirit. And in this room, real men, real women, we wait for the Holy Spirit. I mean, we talk about things are so different today. They're truly not. People are still people. We're still children of God, and we wait. We wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon us, to give us that power, and we pray. We pray together, and we pray that that Holy Spirit will come into our own lives, and that It'll come to the lives of this worshiping community and we'll be witnesses. So the disciples and we, we pray. We pray for understanding. We pray for wisdom. We pray for guidance. We pray for the strength to go on. All of these are things that we pray for. We pray in hope and fear. We pray in faith and we pray in doubt. We pray in obedience and we pray in wonder as to what is coming next. So the disciples went back to the upper room. They went back to somewhere they had already been. They had shared time with Jesus there. And so this practice of returning to the familiar, those centering spaces, those spiritual places, they're typical. That's what we do. We seek places that represent our deep emotional our spiritual connections, those people that we know that that's where our connection lies with them, we will seek them out. We turn to our foundations, don't we? Our building blocks. Building blocks of our faith and our life. That's what we turn to when we're facing transition and change. We'll speak with those we love and trust who sometimes we may disagree with, but we're looking for guidance, we're looking for help. See, we want to find that sense of stability, don't we? That sense of calm. Even though at times of transition there could be confusion, there can be chaos, there can be this unknown future that we're dealing with. And yet, we can come together as the disciples did and we can pray together. Reverend Sprung shared a time that she was making a decision about her ministry. In her outline she shared it and she had gone to a conference and she was trying to figure out a turning point in her life, what to do next. And they were told during a time of a prayer to seek someone else out and pray with them. And as she went around the room and uh, people had paired up and had come together in groups, there was a gentleman standing alone and she went over and started talking to him. And it just so happened he was going through a very similar transition in his life. And so they came together in prayer and they prayed. Yeah, they prayed for guidance. They prayed for a lot of different things. And she says specifically, she didn't pray for willingness. Rather, she and this man prayed for obedience. That's what they prayed for, to be obedient to God. And if we turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 42, we hear this. This is Jesus. Father, if it is your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not my will but your will must be done. At the most difficult moment in Jesus' life, he prayed to God that God's will be done. 
And as we come together in prayer, we pray that God's will be done. See, throughout our lives, there's going to be different times and different needs that we have at different places. And we need prayer. We need each other. That's what we need. We cannot go it alone. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is not a solo responsibility. We need community. We need God. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to pray together. We need to meet. We need to go out and about. We need to work together in Christ's name. We need each other's spirit to be with us as well, to connect together as a family, to support, to challenge, to care. We can live out so many possibilities, so many expectations when we focus on God's kingdom here on earth. So for us today, as we face the future, as we face times of transition, remember that God is present in all of it. God is there. We are in God's hands. We have that comfort. And we know that the Holy Spirit has been promised. And as we wait and pray, we also need to live. Live in the present. And we need to continue to spread the word. We need to continue to love God and love people. There is plenty to be done. Here and now, building the kingdom of God here on earth. So this week, be in community. Be together, be in prayer, and seek God's guidance for what comes next. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be Jesus' witnesses in Taylor, in all the Downriver communities, and around the world. Please pray with me this morning. As we go to God in prayer this morning, we will also be praying over our our financial gifts that we have shared, as well as those prayers that are on each of our hearts. God of wisdom, God of guidance, steer us through our anxious times. Anxious times, the list can go on and on. Times of change and transition where we wonder what is coming next. Times of ill health where even the doctors are and, and those who care are confused as to what is causing the issues. We turn to you in prayer. For those who are grieving, who are facing death, for those who have loved ones who have died, we turn to you in prayer and we ask that you give us comfort. Yes, we're in community together. You call us to be your church and there's separation, there's change that happens, there's difficulties that can come about. We ask that you be with us and you provide us the guidance and the words that we need. God, there are so many things in this world that are out of our control, and we try to control them. And we know that through our efforts, it really isn't possible. But through you, all things are possible. We turn to you, and we turn those things over to you, those things that we cannot take over. And we give them to you and ask you to provide the, the possibilities and the power to overcome. We all want to know what the future holds, what tomorrow brings. We want to know what comes next. And you remind us that you come next because you come first and you were here at the beginning. All of those prayers that we have on our hearts and in our minds, we share them with you at this time as we pray silently.
God of all creation, we give you thanks today. We give you thanks for guidance, for those who share an encouraging word and help us through those times of challenge. We thank you for those who know us and listen to us and will tell us the truth. We give thanks for those who support each and every one of us, who support this church, who support this community, who support all in the world. We give you thanks for all that we have been given, and the gifts we bring this day are just a small part of what you provide. There are times where we push back on our inclination to be generous because we're worried, we're concerned, we have anxiety about the economy and what may come next. We may hold back on inviting others to come and worship, to take part in this joy out of concern about how they may view the church and who we are. We know that you turned to us and said, you are my witnesses to the world. And it is Jesus that we offer to this community. Through all of it, help us to cast our cares on Jesus, knowing that the tomb could not hold the one who will be with us and the one who can carry our worries, our fears with ease. And it is in the name of Jesus who broke the death, the hold of death once and for all that we pray to you and say amen. And as we pray together in community this morning, we raise our voices sharing the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples, saying in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, whether you're worshiping at home or you're in the room, I invite you to stand as you're able and join in singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, Holy,
Now this morning uh, is our comfort in the kitchen. Uh, the meals have been prepared. They're available to be picked up uh, back in the back of the room uh, at the window. And if uh, you're in need of a vegetable plant or two, this uh, will be distributing uh, the remaining vegetable plants that we have uh, this morning uh, after worship till about 12.30 in our Growing in the Lord program. And yesterday was a joy-filled day where we shared with a number of people uh, about 30, right, as I recall, came through and were able to get some vegetables, uh, plants to plant in their gardens. Now, this morning, we thank God for being with us as we make decisions, as we face transitions, and as we wait, we come together in prayer. Go out into the world knowing that God will strengthen us, God will guide us, and we will be with God each moment of our lives. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 